Thank you, Lord and God. Amen. Who in here would like to be really, really cool? Not temperature-wise, a cool person. This is how you do it. Be cool. Invite someone to Sunday school. Amen? That's right. Amen. <laughs> you have your Bibles this morning. Turn to Genesis 6 and 22. And if you see someone here today at the 11 o'clock service that isn't here for Sunday school, maybe consider inviting them to come to Sunday school. Amen. Or invite a stranger, a friend, whoever. Genesis 6 and 22. And that says, thus did Noah, according to all that God command, <coughs> commanded him, so did he. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So in other words, Noah was obedient to God. God saves people who obey his word. Amen. And that's why it's important to invite them to Sunday school and to church. How that shall they be saved except they hear? Amen. Let's go to a fun question this morning. What do you think life would have been like on the ark with Noah and his family during the flood? Stinky. Probably so. That's the first thing that came to my mind, too. <laughs> Several people. Yeah, it probably would have been kind of stinky. <laughs> What's that? Not nice. <laughs> What's that? Crowded, yes. Probably a little crowded for sure. Amen. Anybody else? Noisy, yeah, without a doubt. Amen. <laughs> Maybe that's where melatonin was first uh, discovered. I don't know. <laughs> Get all those animals to go to sleep. Some people challenge the validity of Noah's Ark and the Flood. They argue, it must be a myth because a God, a good God, would never destroy the majority of humanity. But that argument starts with a one-sided idea of God, and it tries to make the facts comply with what they believe. Instead, if we want to know the truth, we have to start with the facts and then draw the appropriate conclusions from them. The facts of the story of Noah's Ark paint a picture of a good and gracious God forced to deal with an unruly human race. It sounds like parenthood. Amen. <laughs> you love your children, sometimes they're unruly and you are forced to deal with them as you have to. The flood is not an obscure event. It's mentioned 39 times in 13 books of the Bible. Few other events have such a large portion of Scripture dedicated to them. Noah's encounter with God makes four points very clear. Number one, God warned Noah of the coming destruction. And same with us. We read the Word of God, listening to the preaching. God gives us warning. Secondly, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and we, too, find grace in the eyes of God. Noah became a preacher of righteousness, thus warning humanity of God's coming judgment. And likewise, we are warned of the coming judgment. And finally, God provided a way of escape. And God provides us a way of escape as well, but it is up to us to follow that way of escape. In Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Noah was probably a little confused when God first spoke to him. First, it must have been difficult to comprehend the idea of a flood so great that it would require such a large boat. The thought of such an enormous act of God must have been sobering. Second, it must have been incredible to think that he, of all people on the earth, had been chosen to escape. Salvation can be hard to accept when we try to comprehend 
how God can be both just and gracious at the same time. But that's the kind of God that we discover if we start with the facts and draw conclusions from Scripture alone. So it's not my opinion, but it's what the Word of God says. Another question this morning. Why do some people have a hard time believing God loves them and wants them to be part of his kingdom? Amen. Sister? Amen. That's probably a lot of it. You know, we feel like the sin we've committed is so bad, there's no way we can be forgiven. Amen. Amen. That's good. Anyone else? Amen. That's probably a lot of it. We think our sin is so bad, there's no way God could forgive us. But that's not true. God gave Noah's generation a way of escape. Noah's escape allowed the human race to survive. As the Bible unfolds, it reveals God's plan for the ultimate victory over sin. He would come as Messiah and give his life so that we might live eternally. God's word also provides instructions on how to live a life that is pleasing to him as well as how to live our lives so that we remain safe and secure. Another question. What guidelines has God given for our safety and our benefit? Sister? The Ten Commandments. Amen. What else? Sister? A conscience. Amen. That's good. Sister? The Beatitudes. Amen. Any others you could think of? Brother? Yeah, the word of God. So his word. That's good. Anyone else? Pastor back there. The Holy Ghost. (laughs) That was too obvious, Brother Gotro. (laughs) Sometimes we overlook the obvious. Yes, the Holy Ghost, obviously. Leads us, guides us. Amen. That's good. Those are great answers. Noah demonstrates that following God is not just about some specific behavior. It's about our attitude. God is God. He has to be the Lord in our lives to be fair, just, good, and faithful. When Noah obeyed God... He was simply acknowledging God's sovereignty, so God's absolute authority. And that's probably an issue that many have with following God. Amen. They don't like to follow, obey authority. Just as iniquity was what caused God to expel Satan from heaven, iniquity is the root cause of much sin. God's word is the road map out of the land of iniquity and into the land of promise. Noah and his family were obedient and lived. The rest of mankind stood up to God and lost their eternal souls. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached, mankind ignored, and they lost their souls. Noah's obedience was no small thing. The ark took Noah and his three sons 120 years to build. It was about one-third the size of the Titanic. And unlike the Titanic, it did not sink. Amen. Genesis 6 and 15 to 16, it gives specific dimensions. If a cubit is understood to be 18 inches, then the total cubic volume of Noah's Ark would have been 1 million 518,000 cubic feet. That's a lot. It could have carried between 20,000 and 40,000 sheep-sized animals. And that's why it was probably pretty smelly in there. Amen. (laughs) Noah's Noah's effort and dedication should have earned him the admiration from his generation, but instead it triggered skepticism and criticism. 
So they were very skeptical and critical of what he was doing. One of the most trying things about following God is that people often resent or misunderstand someone who is doing the right thing. Noah and his family, they were misunderstood. His friends and family did not understand his commitment, but neither could they understand the great honor that God had given him in the history of the world. Sometimes as Christians we'll feel misunderstood, even mistreated, but the truth is everyone feels that way at times. So what is an advantage that we have as believers to advantage over a non-believer when we feel misunderstood or mistreated? Do we have any advantages? Amen. We know God is on our side. Sister? That's right. You know that God understands you. Amen. Brother. Sister? That's good, yeah. We have an instruction book. You feel like this? Read it. That's what we do. Sister? Now we're human too. <laughs> Amen. Right, that's good. That's good. Amen. Yeah, so that's good. So we take it to God so we don't allow it to build up and get worse. Very good. Brother? Right. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you know, so we know God's in control. You know, if you're not a believer, you don't have that. Amen. Brother? All the answers are in the book. That's good. Amen. Anyone else? We also have the Holy Ghost to lead us and guide us. Right, Brother Gotro? Amen. <coughs> Amen. Good, good answers, everybody. When the time came, the heavens opened, and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And I'm willing to bet it started in Louisiana. <laughs> you know, it rained yesterday. I don't know if it rained to your house, but I told my wife, why can't it just be a light rain? Whenever it rains here, it's just torrential downpours. It's crazy. The, the fountains of the deep opened up, and billions of gallons of water covered the earth. Noah and his family remained in the ark for one year and 11 days. And they probably knew how many minutes and seconds, too, I bet. Then Genesis 8 tells us God instructed them to repopulate the earth, which would never be destroyed by water again. Noah found grace, and he took full advantage of the opportunity that was afforded him. In the face of strong, strong skepticism, he followed God. Stories like Noah's teach believers to obey and not worry about people who misunderstand or mistreat them. There was a Pentecostal minister, J.T. Pugh. He was used mightily by God. People who saw the fruit of his, his ministry may have imagined that his life was just wonderful. Everything's always great, right? Right, Brother Gotro, if you're a preacher? So it's amazing. Amen. No troubles ever. Amen. But every, every so often, he told stories about his life. 
They included poverty, spiritual persecution, and even physical violence. He celebrated great miracles, but he also recounted severe trials. And that's typical for the path of the believer. We have great things from God, but we can also expect trials. People who do not have a personal relationship with God cannot understand the way of the believer. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, our gospel is hid from the people who are lost. I've lost my place. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? <laughs> Hope that doesn't mean I'm lost. I guess not. <laughs> Just lost on my iPad here. That's all. But people who have chosen to follow God must understand that their contemporaries are not, so people are not always just being cruel. Sometimes they simply don't understand. Amen. So I know like a school Emily mentioned before, how some kids said you know, things that weren't very nice about her wearing skirts all the time. You know, they just don't understand. Often they're like children who think their, their mom can create money by writing a check. <laughs> Amen. Oh, you need something? Just write a check. Use your credit card. <laughs> or they're like the kitten or baby Emma who doesn't understand the laser pointer cannot be caught. Amen. <laughs> Sister Gotro was telling me this this morning. Keeps her occupied. <laughs> And that's why God instructs us to be witnesses. Born-again Christians are supposed to share their stories with others in hopes that the lost will explore their own relationship with God. If people who hear the testimonies are too fearful or too stubborn or too sure in their own way to honestly pursue God, then they will never understand. God has shared his plan of salvation with the world through scripture. Jesus gave his life and invites us to respond in obedience. So we need to be obedient to the word of God if we're to be saved. Those who respond in obedience will reap immediate benefits as well as eternal rewards. When you first responded in, in obedience to the word of God, what were some immediate benefits that you received? Sister? Amen. Received the Holy Ghost. I don't know if there's anything better you could have received. Anyway. Brother? Yeah, how small we are, how great he is. Amen. That's good. Anybody else get immediate benefits? Brother? Amen. Yes. Overwhelming love and peace. Amen. That, that was mine too. Many of us. Amen. Yeah. Just, you know, get a peace that I had never known. Love like never before. Amen. Anybody else got something you want to share on that? Amen. So we'll end with this this morning. It's critical to view salvation in the right perspective. God promises to be faithful and gracious to us, both now and forever. And he invites us to be part of his kingdom. Yet many people respond with, do I have to? Do I have to obey his word? You know, do I have to dress like this? Do I have to live the kind of lifestyle that the Bible describes and so on? It's sad when people describe salvation in terms of what they have to do. Salvation is not have to. It's not a have to thing. It's a get to thing. Amen. When we follow God's word and accept his invitation to salvation, we get to enjoy infinite rewards both now and for all of eternity. Amen. So it's not a have-to thing, we get to. We get great benefits by living for God. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for salvation.
for dying on the cross for the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Jesus, for your word that gives us the answers that we need throughout life, and most importantly, the way of salvation. We give you the glory, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We pray, Lord, that you continue to move mightily in our services, that you give us an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say this morning, Lord, and that you give us a great burden and desire to reach out to the lost souls. In Jesus' name, amen. And don't forget our prayer before our service at 11. And don't forget, be cool. Invite someone to Sunday school.